Hello to our Facebook friends. We're still setting up here, but uh, welcome to worship. Ton of feedback from the mics there. Good morning, UPC. I am Good morning, UPC. Um, just a reminder that it is communion today. So if you did not get um, the communion cup, they are in the back. Um, and if you are at home, I invite you to get uh, your yourself communion where and we say hello to all our people joining us on Facebook or virtually um, we will be ready to start in just a minute So this morning, I decided that I wanted to um, kind of do another version of what we did last week, which was on Christ, the solid rock I stand, um, and do the Kenyan version that we like. Um, and so the, uh, if you'll keep going, keep going. This is the invitation. 
but we're going to sing the refrain and then the verse one and the refrain. And I invite my choir buddies to sing along with me um, if they remember this. Turning our eyes away from people who are trapped in poverty. 
Forgive us, O Christ, for turning our resources into reasons for pride or grief. Forgive us, O Christ, and by your forgiveness, teach us to follow in your way of generosity. In the merciful name of Jesus Christ. Let us take a moment to consider how we're going to change our action. The good news of the gospel is this. Before a word appears on our lips. God says, you are accepted, you are loved. Hear, hear God's love in front of you. We're all going to have to imagine what the water sounds like. Falls. <laughs> we know it is true. In Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, we are forgiven. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.
In life and in death, we belong to God. I triune God, a holy one of Israel, whom love, worship, and serve. We trust in Jesus Christ, holy human, holy God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captive, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, feeding with outcasts, forgiving the sinners, and calling all to repent and to believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain, and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. With believers in every time and place, 
we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Our second scripture lesson is from Mark, the 12th chapter, the 38th through 44th verses. Let us listen for God's word to us today. As Jesus taught, he said, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces 
and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance, say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Then Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in two, it put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. And then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasure. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all that she had to live on. Holy wisdom, holy word, thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we, we gather together both in person and virtually here in New Jersey, it is growing colder, but we know that your love will warm our way. We know there are places on our planet that need your desperate help, and we lift them up. But for a few moments, God, we ask that you would help us to quiet our minds. Let our hearts be open to what it is that you have to say to us. Help us to unstop our ears, and to open our eyes, to free our hearts so that we might hear the word you have for us today. And I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer, our strength and our song. Amen. In our reading through the Gospel of Mark, we've gotten to the point in the story where Jesus and the disciples have entered Jerusalem. Jesus has ridden in on a colt. Hosanna has been shouted. And then Jesus has overturned tables at the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the elders have tried to question his authority and have tried to trick him with questions about taxes, resurrection, and the greatest commandment. Jesus is able to verbally spar with them and even gets the upper hand. And the Bible tells us the large crowd was listening to him with delight. This is where we start this morning, with Jesus making pronouncements about how we are to live, and then we'll move on to how we are to give. The crowd has already heard that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength, called the Shema in Jewish tradition. But that love cannot be disconnected from what Jesus calls the second commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But what does that look like? Jesus points to some of the religious leaders of his day, leaders that supposedly followed the law to the nth degree, leaders that lifted themselves way above the ordinary worshiper. And Jesus says, that is what you should not do to love God and love neighbor and love self does not mean walking around in long roads. I would imagine that, that means very expensive ones. Looking to be greeted with respect in the marketplace or to have the best seats in the synagogue and the places of honor at banquets. You are not to misuse funds meant for taking care of vulnerable people like widows, and for appearance sake, say long prayers. 
In other words, those leaders who do it all for show and for their own privilege, that's not how to live. Which brings us to Jesus sitting down opposite the treasury, opposite the offering plate, where people would drop their monetary gifts to the temple and to God. Now remember that money in those days was coinage. A gold coin was bigger and heavier than a silver coin, and the coins that were worth almost nothing were made out of inferior metals. If you put a gold or silver coin in the plate, it would make a resounding ping. If you put in something like a penny, it might make a tiny block. So it wasn't just a visual experience, it was an auditory one. Many rich people put in large sums. You could probably see the amount of glitter going into the pot and you would be able to hear it dinging solid against solid, even above the hustle and bustle of prayers being said and wares being sold and people greeting one another. But amidst the rich putting in a lot and the not so rich putting in their portion as well, there comes a poor widow dressed in garments that aren't this year's fashion, maybe even threadbare. I imagine she slinks up to the treasury trying not to garner any attention. Her offering is meager, two small copper coins. Unless you listened very carefully, you might not even have heard the tiny wink, wink as they found their way among all the rest of the offerings. And Jesus points her out, points out her offering, saying, she has put in more than all the rest where they contributed out of their abundance, but she has put in everything she had. What has come to be called the widow's might. Now, November is stewardship time in the church, a time when we begin to look at the budgets for the next year, a time when we try to excite people to consider the rest of their yearly giving, and a time when pastors get agita because they're supposed to preach the perfect sermon that will get people to give more. <laughs> Part of the problem is that we have allowed stewardship to be shrunk into something we talk about once a year, if at all, instead of insisting that stewardship is basically how we live and how we give every single moment of our existence. Now, I noticed that the widow didn't know she was being observed by Jesus. In other words, how we live and how we give isn't judged by those times when all eyes are on us. It is in those quiet moments, those inconvenient times, that we show who we truly are to God. Of course, it's nice to be acknowledged by the right people and for the right things. But if that is why we are giving, if that is how we are living, Jesus is not impressed. I also noticed that Jesus wants to paint a bigger picture. In Jewish law, you were supposed to give a tithe, one-tenth of what you made as an offering to God. Of course, if you made more, that meant you should give more. It was a sliding scale. So Jesus is lifting up that we shouldn't be looking at the amount given, but at the percentage of the whole. Those rich people who had lots of coins and made lots of noise gave a percentage. Let's just say 10% of their wealth. But our widow, with her seemingly meager offering, if it was all she had, it was enormous. 100%. This widow had essentially done what Jesus had told the rich young man who had come wanting to know what more he could do to become part of the kingdom of God. Do you remember what Jesus said to him? 
Go and sell all you have and give your money to the poor and come and follow me. This widow, even though she was already poor, she had given all she had to God. Now, I'm not saying any of us can do that, but it certainly means that we should not be trying to rate anyone else's given. But I do think that Jesus is pointing out to his disciples and to us that how we live, how we give, makes a difference. Not because of what it says to others, but because it is noticed by God. And it is a reflection of who we are. I want to share a musing by Adele Halliday, the team leader of discipleship and witness for the United Church of Canada, that gives us another way of looking at our Gospels. Ms. Halliday grew up in Canada, but spent a year living in a small village in Kenya, East Africa, where she worked with challenged children. And she said she attended church there though she wasn't fluent in Kikuyu, the local language. This is the story she tells. One day, something out of the ordinary happened at church. After the offering plates were brought up to the front of the church, a very old woman stood up and started shuffling slowly forward. I wondered what was happening. We all watched quietly until she was standing in front of the table where the offering plates sat. There was a hushed silence in the sanctuary. And she gently laid something on the table and slowly began to shuffle her way back to her seat. I wondered what she had brought to the front. Well, that morning, as she had prepared to go to church, the woman had considered what her offering would be to God. She was very poor and had no money to give. Still, she wanted to offer something to her creator. She looked around her small home and to her delight, her hen had laid two perfect eggs that morning. She gathered up those eggs and brought them to church with her. And it was these eggs, all that she had, that were offered up on that Sunday morning. Now, if that was all that had happened that day, Ms. Halliday continues, it'd be a nice story about giving all that you have to God. But the story doesn't end there. After church that day, the community had what is called a harambe. It was a fundraiser where people bring things that are sold and the money goes to raise the support of the church, to, to support the work of the church. And those two eggs that the woman had offered during worship were eventually sold at a harambe. They were only two eggs and you could buy those eggs at the market for a few cents. But the community knew this woman and knew what a great gift she was offering. And so that day, her two eggs were sold for over $10, more than some people would earn in an entire week. The woman's simple gift was offered in love. It was received with great mercy from her loving neighbors, and it was given its true worth during the Harambe. It was never really about the eggs. It was about giving and receiving, about mercy and love, about grace and offering what you can to your friends and strangers and trusting that your community will support you when you give of yourself to others. Ms. Halliday concludes, the word harambe is a Kiswahili word, which means let's all pull together. And that day, the whole community pulled together in an amazing way. I never did know the name of this Kikuyu woman, but I have carried her story with me for many years. And this woman, this stranger, taught me a lesson that I will never forget. To me, the idea of harambe, the idea of let's pull together, is how we are to live, how we are to give. Yes, the church needs our financial gifts to pay the bills and to do ministry in this community. 
And I thank you for your generosity in this time of disruption and anxiety and change. But God asks for more than that. God wants our heart and soul and mind and strength. God wants us connected to neighbor and self. And so I say as UPC, let's have Harambe. Let's pull together. The world has shifted and we are trying to figure out what church looks like in this new space. I need your help to imagine what we might become and to figure out the steps to get there. I know that we are all overwhelmed with the frustrations and shifts of life during a pandemic. Very little seems solved, but I hold on to the good news. We can be sure that God is present in our world. We can be sure that God loves us as fiercely as ever. We can be sure that God still invites us to be church for one another and for those around us. We can be sure that no matter how stony the road we trod, no matter how weary or unsettled we feel, God is there. Shattered beneath God's hand, may we forever stand knowing how we live, how we give, is our way to contribute to the coming kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Amen. In our ecumenical prayer calendar, we have gotten to Fiji and Melanesia and Micronesia and Papua New Guinea and Polynesia and the Solomon Islands. And so for all of those people, for all who are looking to love God, love neighbor and love self, you say God in your mercy. Here I, pray. And I want to lift up a special prayer kind of on the ecumenical world stage for, for Ethiopia. I know that Iris and Manasseh must be so worried about um, the country that they spent so much time in and are so connected to. And so for the Ethiopian people, that they be led in knowing how to best go forward from here and that the world know how best to help them. God in your mercy, Aaron. We're also lifting up in the Northeast New Jersey Presbytery, Westfield Presbyterian Church, and Teaneck Presbyterian Church for all of their ministries, for the ways in which we hope to be connected to them as together we move forward. We say, God in your mercy. Yeah. Here are Come to the table as all saints have come, as God's people always do, with love, hope, and question. Bricks without straw, fiery furnace, no wine, five loaves. Who's going to wash the Passover feet? Come to the table with your mourning, old or new or delayed, your celebration of memories and your imagination of possibilities for times yet to come. Because you, you are welcome here in a weeping, laughing communion of saints, in a weeping, laughing communion of us. There is a sacred story that goes way back, older than ancestors, older than anything here, 
to wind blowing over water. God's love was in a garden and a flood drenched rainbow. God's love was in a desert tent, barely fields for gleaning, a slingshot, a mythically big fish, and a new single way in the wilderness. There is a sacred story that goes back to a mother in a barn, a foster father, and a sky full of angels foreshadowing new heaven and earth. We love stories, especially this one of the baby named Jesus, loved by a cow and three magi and many shepherds who grew up, healed people, told awkward parables, and made people angry. At Passover, he broke unleavened bread and poured wine and himself for those who are still saints, although they slept when he needed friends. But the shelter in every place of love gave that time full of death a hope of awakening to resurrection and an Emmaus of self-understanding. And so now we come clothed in our own sad time and our own cloud of weaknesses to hope, witnesses to hope. All the saints we have known, the saints we will know, and the saints we are. Bless us, bless these gifts. May the spirit rest upon this time and this table, surrounded tenderly by our memories of saints as on sacred times and tables long ago, so that this loaf may be broken love, and this cup a well of blessing. For we pray in the words of our ancestors that we claim as our own. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God gives us a feast of rich love. Sharing love, we will we'll never, never be hungry. The bread of love. God wipes away the tears from all faces. This cup is a blessing of comfort. Drinking deeply, we will never thirst. The cup of the covenant, drink.
Spirit of Christ, stay with us where we stay, as familiar as our daily bread. Go with us where we go, full of love as the cup that has touched our lips. May we, your eager and sometimes awkward saints, carry in us a communion from which all can share. Comfort for loss, courage for speaking, compassion for healing. We give you thanks for the shelter and the road. Amen. So now is the time when we give our gifts back to God. We say thank you for all of the gifts that you have shared, um, your time, your talent, your treasure. I would like to remind people that there are still things that are happening here at the church. And we are coming up to one of those times where we could use your help. Um, we are creating 300 side bags for Thanksgiving meals that will be given out at the um, Holy Trinity Food Pantry. And so as of next Sunday, um, we hope to have all of the makings of the bags up here at the church. We're asking that you call Karen um, and talk with her about a time that you would like to help. You can be just your family or you can have you and a couple of friends, or there may be some people who would be willing to be in a larger group. But if you would talk to Karen about that, that is happening the week between the 14th and the 21st. And then on Sunday the 21st, thanks, our Thanksgiving Sunday, um, we are going to need cars, and we're going to need humans to pack those cars, help transport down to Holy Trinity, and then unpack them because the next day, the 22nd, they will be given out um, with turkeys there at Holy Trinity. So um, see Karen either today, she is here, um, or you can call her. Um, I don't know if somebody can put it up on the uh, in the chat office. Uh, it's 973. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't put it out because we're on Facebook. Anyway, call Karen. Um, and now the the, uh, the choir is going to sing. Uh, a song called What I Have I Will Give Thee. And as I was looking at some of the, as we were giving out music earlier, um, I saw on Sally's music, since I don't know where mine is, um, that this was purchased in memory of my grandparents, um, who, all of whom um, started life in a very, um, a widow's mite type of place and they did give all that they had. Oh, no, 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 no. 
Thank you, God, for refreshing us at your table, touching our deepest needs, and calling us to a life shared in memory and hope. May our offerings be our unrelenting waiting, week after week, to remember those whom others ignore. Send us forth with courage and joy in the name of Jesus that we too may become bread and peace for the world. Amen. We're going to sing our song that we uh, practiced last week called We've Come This Far by Faith. And so I invite you to join with me. We're going to sing it at least twice. Now, right? we'll, we'll see how the spirit moves. Yes, it was very nice uh, as part of our offering. Um, Miss Sally was here in person rather than being in Pennsylvania. And so we thank her for, for jumping up and joining with the choir um, and for Miss Amory making sure that that happened. So.
We say hi to our Facebook friends and we say thank you for coming to be with us. Um, we will see you again soon. Let me get off of Facebook.